Great. Good afternoon, everyone. And, and a real sincere thank you for staying on for part two. I know it's very tempting when the VIPs and the ministers and others have, have spoken to, to run out to another event. But you are the, the faithful, and you shall be rewarded this afternoon because we've got a fantastic panel of four. And so uh, we leave it up to the, um, you know, I'm a scientist, and they often accuse scientists of, of um, <clears throat> exaggerating. But we leave it up to the 60 people in the room and the 840,000 people watching it online. <laughs> Give or take. <laughs> no exaggeration at all. Yeah. Um, so our panel this afternoon um, uh, comes from a, a very diverse spectrum of perspectives. <clears throat> we have immediately um, to my right um, Olga, Olga Speckhardt, who's the head of Global Insurance Solutions at Syngenta Foundation. Not Syngenta the company, but Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, next to uh, Olga, to, to the right, we have Paul DeSanka. Now Paul is the manager of the adaptation program of the UNFCCC, from a different perspective. To the right of um, uh, Paul, we have uh, Sophia Haya, and she's the gender and social inclusion leader in the CCAPS program. And making up the last member of our panel, we have Jonathan Mokshell, um, from Ghana, originally from Ghana, but a research fellow here at the German Development Institute. So we're going to pose a couple of questions to them and then open it up to interaction and dialogue with the audience. And, uh, and I understand as well there may be some questions for all of you, uh, those uh, viewers online uh, listening as well. So Paul, uh, first question to you. Um, we know that, that agriculture is key priority for adaptation in all countries, even though it has been left out of the negotiations largely to date. But, I mean, let's imagine agriculture was a party, one of the, the states, you know. It would be the size of China and Russia and the US and Canada all combined. It would have a population of 3 billion people, and it would be responsible for 25% of admissions. Now you can imagine where they would sit in the party negotiations, at least on the high table. But then why is agriculture so left out? But when we look at, at adaptation and its role for some of the more minority parties <laughs> behind agriculture, um, it, it's been included in INDCs, but our question to you is what, what real guidance in, 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 in uh, national adaptation plans can you offer and, and share with the audience here today about how we break this deadlock of some of that neglect of agriculture? Thank you for the question and glad to be here. I apologize I was not able to follow in person the rest of the sessions, but I was one of the ones that was following online, so I'm glad for that opportunity to, to, to listen to some of the talks that went on before this. Um, under the convention, there's a process to, to formulate and implement national adaptation plans. This process was created six years ago. Uh, we have been making a lot of progress, actually, in, in, in helping countries uh, look at adaptation, design strategies to, to address adaptation, both at the national level as well as the sector level. Uh, and agriculture is obviously a key component of that. Uh, I know that in the negotiations, you may get the, the notion that uh, parties uh, object to, to agriculture as, as, as an important component of the adaptation landscape, but it, it's the opposite, actually. Uh, agriculture is one of the key sectors, along with ecosystems, water, health, and so forth. Um, and it's not simply to, to provide food and, and support food security, but also employment, especially for Africa and, and the lesser developed countries. Uh, so poverty reduction strategies rely and depend on agriculture. Most of the economies depend on, on commercial agriculture. Um, uh, I, I think that, that the community like yourself, uh, to, to help advance agriculture in the agenda, one of the things that you could do uh, is perhaps I can, I can say it in terms of a hexagon. So, so in, in case you want to remember something from what I've said, remember hexagon. Uh, there are multiple entry points to, to how to address adaptation. One of them is, of course, depending on, on the climate hazards, whether it's floods, droughts, and so forth. Uh, the second uh, side of the hexagon are, are the sectoral ministries themselves. So whether it's the Minister of Agriculture, Irrigation, Minister of Health, etc. 
The third would be perhaps the place itself, uh, whether it's a city or a region, district, etc. Fourth could be perhaps some of the development themes like the SDGs. Uh, fifth is, is perhaps more specific uh, development themes at the national level. And the sixth side to my hexagon are the actors themselves. Uh, there are different organizations and support systems that look at, at different aspects of, of, the, of the landscape of, of, of adaptation. Uh, these all combine and mix and, and help contribute towards achieving progress on, on, on systems of agriculture. So whether it's crop production or food security at the national level, etc. Uh, so my challenge to you is when you develop your programs, try and address the six sides of the hexagon. Ensure that, that whatever you're doing is at scale that, that will actually have a, a demonstrable pro, uh, outcome at the national level. It's not enough to help a village be, be uh, food secure anymore. Uh, I think that you have to look at how does this scale up in, in terms of, of achieving SDGs? How does it scale up to achieve employment at the national level? How does it contribute to national food security and so forth? Um, so that scale issue crossing all of these levels is quite important in terms of how you can make an impact. Um, secondly is, is perhaps um, the issue of how do we know we are achieving adaptation? How, if, how do we know we're, we're, we're making effective progress towards achieving adaptation? Um, and one of the things perhaps I could challenge you to do is, is also to, to, as scientists, to use a scientific approach. Uh, you're used to developing experiments and testing out hypotheses and so forth. I think it's time we did the same for adaptation. How can we put in place uh, solutions or well, at least attempts at adapting that, that we can then monitor and assess and see what is effective, what doesn't work, and then actually conclude on, on what is the best bets of achieving progress. Uh, I'm glad to, to reflect on, on, on the publication that CCAFS has just produced on, on best bets for agriculture. I think products like that that synthesize the best available science on the topic are quite useful for, for the policymakers that come here. Uh, so we look forward to more of those products and, and hopefully this will be the guidance based on science that will help us make progress on adaptation in the coming years. Great. Thanks very much um, in indeed, Paul. Okay, we move to uh, our second panel member, Olga. Um, now, Olga, we've heard about technology and, and practice and, and, and national plans and, and the wonderful um, hexagon from, from Paul. Um, but we need policies, institutions, services uh, to address a lot of this risk. And a key part of the risk is, is that, that variability and the unknowns that agricultural sector faces. So from your perspective in the Syngenta Foundation, how do we, how do we scale up insurance and, and index insurance for smallholders? And let's remember that this is a group of people who, who, you know, they can't even afford life insurance for themselves and we're asking them to insure their livestock? Thank you, Tony. That's, um that's very close to, to our foundation's uh, heart. And um, I'm very pleased to be here today on behalf of our foundation. Um, hearing for first time uh, the positive steps forward, ensuring that farming um, does not just remain as a, as a footnote within the climate um, uh, talks. So when we talk about insurance, I believe if we would shift the name or revise the name insurance for safe farming or safety net, we will be more popular. Insurance is a word that has a strange perception among all of us and of course the small all the farmers. So um, that is already something that is creating a little bit of a barrier, but we have been working since uh, um, years now through our journey and um, we have um, gained uh, extensive experience. So. Um, insurance is a heavy regulated instrument as a, as a micro loan, so we need regulation to support um, uh, this, this kind of solutions. And when it comes to fintech, when it comes to cyber risks, the regulators, they become a little bit nervous. So we need to, to be with them and see them also as a facilitator and uh, an enabler to us instead of a uh, Restrictor, so that is very important. Behind the regulator, there is a government behind, 
And as we mentioned this morning, um, we have to ensure to, to raise the voice and, and, and bring the government on board to create the space for the private sector to, to become more active and to support the venue. Then, of course, the, the main issue here, it's the distribution channel is key for access to, to insurance. So we need to make sure that these distribution channels are affordable. And when it comes to affordability, we need to come up with solutions that they are centric, farmer-centric. So we need to involve the farmers in the product design. We need to, to try to, to offer the best solution for the smallholder farmer at the best um, affordability or at the cheapest price. Um, technology is for sure uh, one key component as well. So technology needs also regulation behind. So up to now we have been able to, to implement insurance policies and, and, and claim settlements and payouts through um, M-Pesa in East Africa. And we hope that we can roll out this uh, worldwide. So we need regulation behind and, and newcomers to implement that too. And um, last but not least, uh, um, looking at uh, insurance is not just uh, um, the end uh, itself, I think we need to think about how to um, empower risk management tools before it comes to insurance in order, in order to reduce the risk as much as possible and to come up with a solution that is not just in the hands of the smallholder farmer and so design that need on top uh, before that strong risk management uh, in place. Financial education, capacity building, um, data investment. Uh, this is this is really crucial. So this is where where all comes in 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 one package, uh, Tony. And I think that's uh, that's what we can share. So we can see already a lot of support from from each and every um, actor within the value chain. We are getting there, but of course we are still at the very um, initial uh, step in, in the journey. So that's all we can say. Great, thanks very much, Olga. And I mean, what a wonderful phrase that you, you're no longer insurance salesman or a salesperson, but you're a safety net merchant. Yeah. <laughs> so next time you sit on an aeroplane next to somebody, ask them if they're a safety net merchant. And, and that was particularly impressive, Olga, that you spoke without notes, because Olga's been flying around Southeast Asia, um, five countries on the road for the last two weeks. And after this, she's immediately getting on another aeroplane to Geneva. So incredibly impressive. Thanks very much. So let's uh, jump to Sophia, Sophia Haya. Um, and Sophia, we're told by UN Women that it's going to take 124 years to address the SDG on gender. 124 years. We've heard that um, the feminization of agriculture, a huge amount in there. And the typical response of many researchers is, well, you know, yeah, but I have been counting the number of female farmers. Um, we are building the female researcher pipeline. You know, what else do you want me to do? Um, so, and, and what advice do you have for those who, who don't have quite as nuanced understanding about how we mainstream gender, how we bring gender to the real forefront in, in the whole um, climate solution uh, debate? Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, Sorry, Tony. Um, well, what I would say to that person is that we still have a really significant gender gap in agriculture. And, and so, you know, I would agree with you and women that there's still a long way to go. I really hope it doesn't take, you know, over 100 years to resolve this gap. Um, and I think there are things that we can do to make sure it doesn't take that long. I don't know if we have that long. But, you know, we're still at the point where women's access to agricultural input, inputs, information, credit, uh, other resources and technology is less than that of men, smallholder farmers. Um, you may have heard that FAO has said that if they did have equal access to these resources and services and finance and so forth, uh, women smallholder farmers production would increase by 20 to 30 percent and global food production would increase, increase by 10 to 14 percent globally. So that's a really significant increase just for the world, um, never mind uh, for women farmers. 
Um, but you know, another need to cl another reason to close this gap is something we've heard about earlier today: increasing women's uh, income, increasing their status, increases nutrition and food diversity levels within households and communities, uh, as well as education, in particular with children, but um, also nutrition of the entire household. You know, CCAS research has showed that women and men smallholder farmers, for many of these reasons, have different. Um, uh, levels of vulnerability and different levels of resilience. And so as climate change continues to take effect, uh, women may fall further and further behind in the agricultural gap if we do not take some real strong steps to, to work with them and improve this situation. You know, they have less access to information and early warning. They tend to be more reliant on natural resources for income and subsistence. And as I said, they've had less decision-making power at household, community, and national levels as well. So in order to close this gap, where should we focus? What are some of the key leverage points? Um, I'll just talk about a few that I've seen um, make a difference, and I think that we can continue to make a difference in. We need to increase women's decision-making power, and you know we've all heard this. But it needs to happen at the household level, at the community level, as well as at the national level. And you know, the UNFCC has been focusing so far on women as negotiators and women as decision makers in the global forums and at the national level. But we really need to be looking farther down as well. Um, you know, CARE, for example, found that if women at the local level are involved in community groups, either producer groups or other groups, as leaders they actually have greater control over their own income than women who don't. So the difference was twice as much, actually. 69% of women in collectives with women leaders and 62% of women in collectives with mixed gender leaders can control their income compared to 34% otherwise. So, you know, we're talking about really crucial changes that, that can be made. Um, CCAFs has also found that women's organizations are an effective um, medium, effective platform for both increasing women's agricultural production, decreasing their workload, and increasing their community status and confidence. Uh, in Nepal, for example, we've worked with a women's organization in, an, in a rural village uh, to establish and manage a solar-powered irrigation system, which has not only increased their production by three times, so the crops per season have increased from one to three, but it decreased their labor loads and has increased their confidence. And, and these kinds of activities are, I think, a way forward. One of the other issues I think we need to think about is how can we move, how can we encourage women to move into non-traditional gender, you know, non-traditional roles for women um, so that they can take advantage of new opportunities. And I'll give you an ex a couple of examples. IFAD in Ghana worked with local communities on commodity chain development and rural infrastructure development. And one of the interesting findings of this is that certain women in some of these communities were able to move into roles and value chains that were traditionally uh, of men, um, traditionally male um, roles. For example, they became agro-dealers. Uh, they, they took on tractor service businesses, so they rented or owned tractors and rented them out, and they began to take up business opportunities in industrial crops rather than in subsistent crops. Uh, it, CCAFs has um, a similar example, found a similar example in India with the use of large tractors, but it's an open question still. Uh, when we did the gender analysis of the use by women of laser land leveling technology, uh, it was found that women did not use the technology. Now, they were not able to access it because of um, gender and cultural um, attitudes about the interaction of women with men outside of the community, the access of women to resources, and the few women who did actually use it, something under 10%, only were able to access that technology through their male family members. So, you know, this I think is a really important issue. Um, for us to think about. There are ways this can be encouraged, and what can we do to encourage more of this? Uh, related to that is how do we move women into more profitable value chains, um, possibly value chains where men are, or possibly valuable profitable value chains based on women's activities and women's preferences. 
um, you know, what are these priorities? How can we ensure that women in the value chains, chains are at the more profitable end of the value chains? They're not at the vulnerable end. Um, how is there a role, for example, for women in red meat value chains? We don't often think about that, but actually women make up two-thirds of the world's 600 million small livestock managers. So that will be sheep and goats. So where are women in those value chains? And that is red meat, but that would also be dairy. So how can we build on those places where women are, where women are active, um, and help them uh, benefit more from that? You know, one of the issues that we have been talking about for years and years and years is increasing women's access to land. And that continues to be a really important issue because, of course, how can women can, um, participate um, independently and be empowered in agriculture if they don't have control over land? Now, we do know that by now, 52% of countries in developing regions actually have instituted laws uh, around women's ability to inherit land and other property. But we're finding that at the local level, we're not seeing that 52% of developing countries um, are, have women using land equally with men. So how do we break that gap? Um, what are some of the strategies and options, alternative strategies and options that can be used to um, support women's access? Some of, the, some of it is just that um, women's, uh, men's land and men's agricultural activities take priority over women's so that women may have access to the household land but can only work it after the men's plots have been taken care of. So that gives them possibly a shorter growing season. It, it also means that they need different kinds of agricultural information, which is another issue. Um, but there are um, other options such as land rental, the use of common property land, working with communities and with leaders in communities to come to arrangements that work for women and are not resisted by communities. Uh, and moving into climate information, uh, which we've talked about quite a bit here, is it reaching women? Well, we know that there is a global digital gender gap of um, 11 to 12 percent globally, but in the developing world it's as high as 30 percent or over. So, and we also know that in the ur rural areas the gap is bigger than in the urban areas. So women farmers do not have mobile phones to the same extent than men do. And, you know, I think when we're talking climate information, weather information, agro information, we really need to keep that in mind. We need to find different ways of reaching women with information, and we need to ensure that they're interested in reaching information. I just spoke with someone during the break who said they were investigating mobile money transfer for women uh, in, Latin, in, in a country in Latin America, but it wasn't working out too well for them because of the transaction costs. So if, if because women have lower levels of access to resources, if the information is not valuable to them, they are much less apt to spend the money to access it. And, and the issue of content for women, information for women that is of value to them, is the kind of information they need, is also really critical. For example, if women are um, working their land a month or so later than men are, then they're going to need different kinds of climate information. And CCAPS has found that in some regions, women are actually looking for cessation of rainfall information rather than onset of rainfall information, which is what their male family members are looking for. They be, may be more interested in likelihood of drought later in the season. And so there needs to be some understanding of the different information needs of women and men, but also other groups in a community. And then finally, I'll just quickly, um, since we're here in, at the UNFCC, you know, how do we get gender into climate policy at the global and national levels? It's not there yet. I'm happy to hear that there is a gender action plan um, that's in final stages of approval, and I'm looking forward very much to seeing that. Um, but we've done some analysis of NDCs, of um, national climate strategies, national agriculture strategies, and you know, while gender is still kind of in the social side of things, in the social development, in sustainable development, in health, but it's not in agriculture, it's not in energy, it's not in um, you know, climate, strategies and we need to find a way to bridge that gap.
Thanks, uh, Sophia. That was really powerful examples and, and, and giving a much more nuanced understanding of, of how this all comes about because we, we all have biases and perspectives and understanding. And, and mine was shaken a couple of years ago when my daughter had to write an um, essay at high school around um, hunter-gatherers. And, and she said to me, so does that mean that the men were the hunters and the women were the gatherers? Um, and you know, the men might sit around doing nothing all day or come back with no meat and, and they, would, they would challenge the woman, but we hope you can still feed us because you were out there gathering. And she, she had this concept of, of, of early humans, of the men being quite indolent. Um, and, and that was her kind of advocacy. But also, you know, as you were talking about the, the <clears throat> gender action plan, I was also thinking, well, you know, when you challenge these male policymakers, listen, we've got this gender gap. We've got a gap. We've got to fill the gap. And, and they have. They've given you that acronym, Gender Action Plan. Well, we, we've solved the gap because now we have a gender action plan and therefore the problem must be solved. But, but clearly you've, you've stretched our minds and, and this whole dimension of it's a social issue but we've got to link it up with technology and policy was, was incredibly powerful. So now we're going to break some new ground in a panel. And the new ground that we're going to break is um, <clears throat> Jonathan has been doing a great number of studies recently and um, the questions that our moderators put up for us and the organizers are great. And he said, well, I'd like to tweak these a little bit. And I've, I've lost his bit of paper. So first of all, an apology to Jonathan. Um, and secondly, a um, confession to all of you that I'm going to ask the question that we originally had, and he's going to give an answer to a different question. <laughs> and your, your, <clears throat> your task is to try and work out what that real question should have been. And we'll let Jonathan, at the end of this, Tell us, and, and sorry, I was just looking for it, but I've lost, I have, I, uh, and my sincere apologies to you. So, um, but, but I do understand you've been working on this link between food systems, value chains, and policy, and this, this blended approach to sustainability. How, how do we put that into uh, climate change action? So, is everyone ready? He's going to give an answer, and you've got to guess the question. Go for it, go for it Jonathan. All right. No problem. So, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially to also represent the German Development Institute and also talk a bit about our project, our civil project and also our climalog projects. I want to start off with just um, yeah, three main big questions that I think it's on my mind. And the first question is how do we feed the world and especially dealing with healthy foods and dealing with the problem of hunger in developing countries and the challenge of obesity or overweight in developed countries. That's one first question. The second question is, how do we protect our planet in itself currently? Seeing that agriculture itself contributes to the problem in terms of global greenhouse gas emissions, at least one-fifth, or around estimation of 24% to total greenhouse gas emissions. So agriculture is certainly part of the problem and definitely to be part of the solution. Now the third thing is, if we look at the business sector and also the fact that farmers are there to make profits, to improve their welfare, then that also brings in the part of people and how do we bring our farmers into the whole ball game of how to feed the world and especially to also reduce challenges that we are seeing today in terms of depletion of natural resources. So that's the first three big questions that I have in mind. Now, looking at these three big questions, one will say that it's not something that is just happening. What we see is that it's happening within a political system, an institutional setting, and also there are governance challenges that is affecting how to achieve these goals, and especially to achieve the 1.5 or below 2 degrees targets that we are talking about. So certainly agriculture will play a very important role in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and at the same time we want to produce more and sustain our planet and also be able to make some profits. Now looking at these big questions, one will say, well, this is very complex if we look at people, planets and profits within a policy and an institutional setup combined with governance challenges. This is certainly complex. And moreover, research and also implementation have sometimes moved away from this complexity. 
to pilot-based approaches where we just want to go on and implement certain programs based on short-term returns and in terms of how to achieve specific goals. But I think it's important to really confront this complexity with complex solutions. And these complex solutions will mean we move away from the current approach and move on to a more systems-based approach. And this systems-based approach also is very much in line with what Paul just mentioned in terms of looking at the different entry points. Now, there will be different approaches and different solutions that one wants to look at. Now, if we look at this, I think one integrated approach will be to look at sustainable food systems as a way to solve the problem or to bring agriculture to a low carbon path. Now, sustainable food systems will also mean that we look at the entire chain from production until it gets to the final consumer and also post-consumption. Now, from this very entry point, if we just look at the production sector alone, what we have now is that we have high use of external input, which is affecting the kind of agriculture that we have now in terms of the practices. One approach will be then to think about moving to bringing in more ecological approaches, if it's agroecology or agroforestry, or conservation practices or climate smart agriculture, or systems of rice intensification, and other strategies that will put agriculture on a low carbon path. But at the same time, we also don't want to miss the fact that there are technologies that have been developed, and these technologies would also help to put agriculture on a low carbon path. So this is where the blended sustainability concept comes in, that there are ecological issues that need to be dealt with. At the same time, we have economic issues that we want to deal with. And we also have people in terms of the social setup within a policy and institutional environment. Now, certainly there will be trade-offs. So if we want to improve ecological or we want to achieve an ecological goal, what it means is that we want to move more into ecological practices. Now, that will mean that to some extent, from the initial stages of making such a move, studies have shown that, well, it can affect profits and that can also affect livelihoods. But at the same time, we also want to recognize that there are people and economics involved, people in terms of the social setting and also livelihoods and the poor farmers and also the economic component. So there will definitely be trade-offs if we want to improve our ecological goal or if we want to improve our economic goal or social goal. There will be trade-offs. So it's important to recognize that these trade-offs will be there. Now from these trade-offs, we can also think about what will be the synergies among the different goals. Now if there are synergies between, let's say, using improved varieties, for example, and also reducing deforestation. Could that be a goal that we want to achieve? Now, from this, one would say that we will have to think about the whole system and think about the sustainability in terms of a blended approach where technology will play a role and ecology and also economics or profit will play a central role. And whilst minimizing one and increasing the other will help us to achieve the overall growth and especially also to achieve the kind of transformation that we are talking about. Now, if we move from the production setup, we want to then move on to looking at processing, for example, if we want to process the different crops that we have. Currently, what we have is that at least 30% of our food is lost as a result of post-harvest losses, especially in developing countries. Now, this can do a lot in terms of alleviating hunger and also improving welfare. Now, one thing that one can think about which technologies will help to reduce this as a way, and especially also to think about farmers and how to improve their welfare. And this is where the need for digital technology also comes in. If we think about applying a blockchain application concept as an example, this can be a way to improve the current situation and also to minimize losses during the consumption stage. So I think the main point here is that is to move then to a more systems-oriented approach rather than just single projects. Great. 
Thanks very much indeed, um, and, and apologies as well for losing the, the bit of paper. So we come to our second round of questions, and we're going to take a, a very quick um, round here because we do want to reserve some time for the audience to interact. So in the same way that Twitter only allows you 140 characters, um, we're going to ask you to speak within 140 words, okay, in, in reacting to this. So firstly to you, Paul, um, and it, it's around the value of science. And remember, science is a, it's a noun, it's not a verb, so we don't do good science, but science is a body of knowledge. Now, can that body be neutral? We know since um, Kyoto and Paris Agreement, there are over one million articles about climate change and the role of humans, was it anthropogenically induced? And more than 90% of them said it was. So that's seen as consensus by many, but refuted by others. So can we get to this climate, kind of the science neutral space where we, where we have evidence and, and maybe the interpretation of it could differ, differ but the, the soundness of it is there or is that just wishful thinking on behalf of researchers who want to be valued more or, or come out of the closet or whatever? <laughs> that counts for three words. <laughs> um, well, science is a difficult issue. I, I think, and many of us started off as scientists and then you gradually work towards uh, sort of applying your science to, to to, to important questions of policy and application and so forth. I, I think the important thing is, is, is to, to, to do the best available science you, you can do in, as objectively as you can and, and conclude and, and convey messages that you come up with, with without being prejudiced or, or become a lobbyist against a certain mindset. That's important. Uh, the, the Paris Agreement and all these other agreements with the Senda and so forth are full of, of uh, well-negotiated agreements as to what the targets ought to be and, and, and reference points and so forth. Under the Paris Agreement, for instance, we have the, the, the sort of the policy decision on, on what to base future assessments on in terms of the global goal for adaptation. It's just a less than two degrees uh, global temperature rise, for instance. That implies that when, when policymakers are going to be making decisions about how to adapt to climate change, they're going to constrain themselves to a future of a less than two degrees. Uh, I know that a lot of scientists do not believe that or will not accept that, so they will almost explore a whole range of temperatures. That we, I don't believe that we're going to achieve less than two degrees. I, I believe it's most likely going to be three or four or five degrees. So I'm going to, to develop science and advise my policymakers to, to maybe go towards a four degree world. I think this is the confusion that arises for, from people that, that make science with, with being a lobbyist against a certain uh, outcome. Um, I think it's important uh, to, to explore the, the continuum between just coping to climate change and plan adaptation and, and uh, <laughs> uh, loss and damage measures and so forth. Uh, and, and, and these targets in, in the agreements help us take care of that. For instance, for adaptation, I, I would imagine that if I was a policymaker, I would be planning against a less than two degree world. But I would also be putting contingent measures in place in case we don't achieve the less than two degrees, uh, so using insurance or other measures and so forth. So we have to look at the whole landscape of, of, of solutions and then use science to help the policymakers to, to decide on, on what are the thresholds of their decision making and, and how do they balance or optimize the resource investments into the different types of solutions, etc. And then learn from, from experience. There are a lot of events that are happening pretty much every month, every week. Uh, there's a lot of wealth of, of, of information to be collected from how people are responding, what the impacts are, and use that in a scientific manner to, to actually advise people on how to best respond to future impacts and events. Thanks, Paul. And, and Paul assures me that was 140 words. It's just that everything else was in square brackets. Great. Um, Olga, in 140 words, please, could you um, uh, explain... You know, if insurance is one of those innovations we're looking at, we're also looking at microfinance, um, we're looking at IT systems, we're looking at, at other innovations. How do we package those all together for, for real transformation? Yeah. So first of all, he mentioned insurance, isn't it? Two years ago, he would tell me, oh, no, this one again. So that's already a good step. So, yeah, it comes to a holistic approach, to, Tony. We, we really want our foundation, our work, in, ins in the insurance space, we want um, 
climate insurance solutions, microfinance, uh, agriculture development, um, um, to form a holistic um, support um, and come together uh, for powerful agriculture impact uh, and outcome. And so what the rivers is, is actually enhance the resilience uh, of smallholder farmers through access to insurance solutions, um, enabling also the graduation from poverty by the re reducing or removing uh, those risks uh, from their shoulders and, and further invest confidently in, in their farms. Um, expand financial inclusion by encouraging uh, lenders, microfinance institutions, uh, uh, banks to increase agricultural lending is fundamental and to ensure business uh, continuity um, of farmers and lenders um, such as MFIs through, through major natural disasters that they are also there and that comes to uh, a greater collaboration between the three levels from micro meso level up to the government level. Is that 140? Great, okay? right, 139. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so moving to, to Sophia, um, you spoke a little bit about the, the need to um, uh, shift the paradigms to ensure these enabling policies, to look at it, but you know, can you share also with us um, the, the challenges in trying to do that? What, what are, the, what are the, the things that we'll need to have in place to ensure that gender transformation? Okay, well, let me, you mentioned policymakers. Um, let me expand. And given that it's bit. gender, we're going to let you have 280 words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only have 140 planned, but, <laughs> but I'm sure I can uh, <laughs> expand. Um, in terms of policy, you know, I mentioned uh, national level and global policy around climate is still really um, lacking a lot of significant gender in terms of how, how do women, um, how are women affected by climate change? How do they respond? What kind of support do they need? Um, what kind of capacity development? But, you know, even at that level, we're starting to make progress. Um, NDCs, NAPs, some of the, you know, countries, for example, in Africa are starting to develop gender, climate, gender and climate strategies. So this is starting to happen. Um, but where we still see a huge gap is at the level of local policy and uh, sub-national policy, where policymakers may not be aware of gender policies at the national, from the national level, or if they are, they may have no idea of how to implement such policy and how to develop programs for women. So I think that there needs to be an understanding of how national policy trickles down to the local level and can make a difference in the lives of women and men, and whether that's about capacity development of policymakers or multi-stakeholder meetings at the local level among policymakers, researchers, civil society, women's groups, and so forth, t to understand the implications of policy for the lives of women and men and young people at the grassroots level is, is really an important area for moving forward because you have all kinds of beautiful policies at the national level, but if they're not understood and acted on at the local level, there's, there's, it's not going to make a difference. Um, the other area I'd like to talk about, um, partly because I've been informed that today is National Children's Day in India, so in honor of that, I'd like to talk about the role of young women and men um, in technology and using technology for agriculture, and that it's about mobile phones, but it's also about increasing digitization, as we've heard earlier. Um, this week, I was, at, uh, I was at a panel where the Japanese Ministry of Agriculture showed us a video about the use of drones in agriculture to assess the quality and the, the status of crops and the use of cropland. You know, if we're not careful, it's only the young men who are going to be a in a position to use these technologies and take advantage of these technologies, not only in terms of owning them, but also understanding how they work, um, getting education to operate them and understand how to, to work with the information that comes from them and analyze results. Um, I just lost my train of thought. But, um, so I think that's an area where we really need to be aware that young women also uh, have a lot to offer in this field uh, and would be happy to take on uh, these new skills and opportunities as well. Uh, and how, how will that happen? 
Um, and talking about data, you know, big data was another topic that came up this week, big data for agriculture and so forth. And, you know, where is the sex disaggregation of big data? You know, where is sex disaggregation and gender in the iCloud, in the, in the cloud? Um, we know that beyond tracking consumer preferences. So, you know, when are we going to get beyond understanding women as shoppers online? And when are we going to understand that there's a lot more that women can accomplish and benefit from online? Uh, for example, Wikipedia um, is, is, you know, something we all know. It's very popular source of sharing information and knowledge. Um, uh, University of Oxford did an analysis of Wikipedia contributors and over half of them are young males from either Europe or America. So that says a lot not only about gender, but it also says a lot about who's constructing knowledge uh, for this next century. And you know, women editors are even, you know, almost non-existent. So actually the editor role is primarily also young male. So, but, you know, what does it say about the contribution of people from different parts of the world? Apparently there are more Wikipedia contributors in the Netherlands than in all of Africa. So, you know, I think this is an issue that we all need to be thinking about as well, not ter just in terms of gender, but in terms of social inclusion. Um, and youth in the developing world. How can they take, a, take advantage of this? And the final um, comment to make, since I have 280 words, so I'll use my last 40 words or so, on um, the need to really, you know, we've been talking about index insurance and so forth. We really need to understand how um, women can have access to these security, different types of security nets. You know, women are not yet using index insurance to a great extent, they could. Some of the barriers that we've been finding in our initial research is that uh, is financial literacy. It's not necessarily access to resources, but it's sometimes a different attitude towards the degree of risk that they're willing to accept or think is likely. Uh, so there, there needs to be an understanding of how we can develop innovative models for social security nets for women as well as men that go beyond cash transfers, which, you know, is not necessarily a bad thing, and microcredit, but we need to actually give women, you know, work with women as well as men to have an ongoing sustainable mode um, for providing this sort of uh, support. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Good. So, so, Jonathan, you introduced us to this concept of, of blended sustainability. And it's, a, 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 it's a lovely term. And, and, and one of the takeaways from it was, well, if you have a simple problem, don't design a complex solution for it. But if you have a complex problem, don't think that a simple solution will fix it. And, and so in, in trying to come to a complex solution to a complex pri uh, problem such as climate change, is, how, how do we develop, what, what are the approaches to have those complex solutions where you are blending the, the, the social, the financial, the ecological perspectives together? How, how do we reconcile the need for, for progress but also recognize that complexity? Well, I think, first of all, um, starting with the concept itself, I think if we look at the political economy angle of this, um, there are different understanding in terms of what is um, sustainability and what is not sustainable. So the first thing is for all of us to really recognize these differences in, in divergent opinions, first of all, among the, the concept itself and among the different actors who are in this field. And one of the things here will be to, first of all, see what is the understanding of, let's say, the ecological practices that we need. If we talk about ecological practices, for example, the use of GMOs, or if we talk about the use of external inputs such as agrochemicals, or if we think about the economics perspective, I mean, is it all just about making profits? I mean, what about the people who are in the field? So first of all, there is a need to recognize the divergent opinions and try to recognize, re reconcile this through a more multi-stakeholder approach. And I think this will be very beneficial to, first of all, reconcile the different ideas and to really make real progress when it comes to sustainability. That will be the first thing here. Now, the second thing will be also to think in terms of a systems approach. So if it's definitely a systems approach, then what will work in Germany might not necessarily work in Ghana. And we need to look at a different ecology and think about what works where and why. 
And this will mean that we need to look at things also from a farmer-led approach in terms of what the farmers think is the real need on the ground. Now, if we use this, then we'll be able to, first of all, solve the problem and also meet the sustainability need that we need to drive agricultural development. Great. Thanks very much. Super. Um, so now we're going to um, come to the audience, and, and given that we are trying to um, address our gender action plan, uh, typically, as you saw in the first session, it is a gentleman like myself with white hair uh, and slightly older and male and white that uh, jump to the microphone first. So we're going to give the female members of the audience the first round of questions, okay? We'll have a second round, but first round of questions, please, are females only. State your name and uh, please avoid a long narrative like some of those white gray-haired gentlemen did um, and jump to your question. And you can either address it to one member of the panel or a general question that they'll try and reflect back to you with. So please, ladies, don't make me look like a fool by not asking a question. <laughs> well, more of a fool than I am, sorry. Thank you. I'll ask a very quick question. What, what is the penetration rate of microinsurance amongst, what is the penetration rate of microinsurance among small farmers in Africa at this time? And what kind of insurance exactly do they have? I mean, what are the terms and the, et cetera? Great, let's take three or four questions as a bundle. Thanks. I'm Annette Fries, I'm with CCAPS, and I just want to touch on something that came up earlier today where uh, Bruce mentioned that there was a decision on agriculture and the substa. And since the topic of this is transforming agriculture for the future, I was wondering if someone on the panel or all of the panelists would say something about how they think this, could, this decision can help transforming agriculture for the future. Thank you. Great, thanks. One last question. My name is Ibrahim Kaya. How uh, we can um, start a now a present where we can say now we can start to a deal to handle with the climate change. Did you understand? No, sorry. I, um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, firstly, we need a present where we, uh, as humanity, can say now we have understand the climate is changing, and we start to handle it. Okay, so awareness that we have climate change and what are the concrete steps we're going to do to adapt, yeah? So adaptation issue. Is that adequate reflection of your question? Yes, we have to understand the industry all kinds of pollution that there is a... Uh, uh, we have to understand that there is a... Uh, thought of acting, uh, when is the present uh, that we can say now we have all understand that we have to deal. Great. That might have been Jonathan's missing question for me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. To the panel, um, very short because we, we want to have a second round of questions and then you are going to get a chance at the end to do a, give a very brief summing up, okay? of your perspective. So uh, let's start at the other end. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, I'm not really sure I got a question very well, but um, if generally we talk about the issue about um, awareness in terms of um, where we are now in the stream of time, I think generally there is a lot of awareness unless we want to bring Donald Trump into the picture. But many people really know what is going on in terms of um, yeah, climate change and how this is affecting us as humans uh, affecting the planet and definitely the idea is how to do something about this and what to do. And I think for a forum like this, the ideas that have come out from the different sections are all things that I think are actionable plans that we can feed into the policy process itself and also to serve as evidence for what really needs to be done. 
and how to implement this for real change or real transformation to take place. Great. Sophia? Uh, this, is, this may be my, take the place of my closing remarks or I might build on it, but I think, you know, um, in all of this, the policy and the action, we need to recognize that there's no one homogeneous kind of person that policy can do something for. You know, there needs to be that understanding of the disaggregation by sex, by age, by socioeconomic class, by ethnicity, by region, um, that different groups have different um, contributions that they can make to adaptation, to mitigation, um, or they may suffer different consequences um, from the impacts of these. But I think we also need to get away th from this kind of dealing with the vulnerable, but we need to understand that different groups in society have different sets of capacities and different perspectives and needs in relation to climate policy and action. Th thank you. On the decision on agriculture, um, I think it does provide an entry point for all of you experts to, to submit information and work together with the constituted bodies under the convention. These are the bodies that, that develop uh, common methodologies for, for countries to apply when they're developing their plans, whether it's NDCs or NAPs and, and so forth. Uh, what the, this, this decision does is to allow you to, to provide your best available methodologies and science and understanding on, on how to address the issue of adaptation for the agriculture sector. Uh, is it going to transform agriculture? I, I think five years from now, we, we hope that with your very direct inputs into this process, there will be uh, not common but consistent approaches to addressing adaptation so that we, we, we can support the best available solutions to, to agriculture and, and other sectors, as well as be able to, to, to monitor and verify that, in fact, we are doing the best that, that's possible to do with the resources that are available. So I'm hoping that this will enable and facilitate uh, your inputs a lot more than in the past. Uh, whether it's going to actually transform the agriculture sector, I think that's up to you in terms of, of what you, you advance and you push and guide the countries to, to embrace in terms of the policies that they're going to be implementing. Great throwback. Well, thank you. Uh, penet Olga. Penetration rate in insurance. I would have wished another kind of question, like what is the impact rate um, on the ground. So, um, yeah, I can talk about East Africa, where we are mostly act, but... Um, there is a world beyond Africa, I used to say. And um, we are training insurance companies and designing products jointly with insurance companies and the reinsurer to increase you know, the, 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 the knowledge of where to index insurance, which is what makes sense in the space where we do work. Indemnity insurance is far too expensive for the smallholder farmers we want to serve, and index insurance is picking up. I can tell you that in Kenya, it's about 20%. Now, the potential of that is, is really, really huge, and we need to bring it to a commercial approach in order to, create, to increase the volumes that they are needed for the appetite of the insurer to come in and also the reinsurer. So the potential is huge. I cannot give you just a precise figure worldwide, but it's, 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 already, it's already picking up. So. In Kenya, it's about 20%. Now, what the impact? Correct. Correct. Great. Um, so with the indulgence of the organizers, because um, we're quite uncertain about when the finishing time is, because of our adjusted program, let's have a second round of questions, and we can have um, everyone from the audience, gentlemen in the front, and then Olu. Thank you. Uh, at least two years about discussing what are sustainable systems and, and how to build upon this, thinking about mitigation and adaptation. Uh, I, I would like to hear your views about the policy design implications and discussions that we will need to manage to try to support different countries to, to really implement policies to be able to put this different systems on the ground, because when, when we're talking about sick insurance, for, for instance, that is one very important tool, index approach, uh, more specifically, but uh, the, the different systems of agriculture that can take place relies a lot on, on government capacity 
and and the ability to subsidize to at least at the beginning to to, to bring uh, innovative solutions to the table. How how do you see policy design about this? Thank you. Great. Uh, Olu? <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Olu Ajayi. Uh, I work with City. My question, first question is to Olga. Thank you very much for the news and name you suggested. I think calling calling it safe farming, I think it's it's much more I think it's, it resonates well better than, than insurance. But you see, you rightly pointed out that um, insurance is highly regulated. Okay? And to make insurance ready, to be, make farmers insurance ready, there's a lot of issues with data that requires public investment, public goods. To what extent, from your own experience, do you think that the governments are willing to uh, make this public investment into insurance? Now, sorry, sorry, Tony, just last question. It's to you, Jonathan. You talked about systems and products. This is very, very good. Um, the farmers themselves are actually, they have been practicing systems and products for, for over generations. It's, I think it's, it's resonated with what you are saying. Now, my question is, to what extent do you think farmers should be encouraged as co-create co-creators of knowledge on climate change, learning from them on the indigenous practices on, on climate change that they've been doing over the years. Thank you. Great, and I think there's a one gentleman here in the red and then we'll have to have coffee time and talk to you. Thank you very much. My name is Anzal Ibing from Regeneration International. And I have a question for Jonathan. I really liked what you were presenting and I wondered whether you could give a concrete example of you mentioned that he's done research, or I don't know exactly the nature of your work, but it, it was quite conceptual and sounded great. And I wonder whether you can give some concrete examples of, of that applied or of the research you've done uh, with regard to the concepts you presented. Great. So I'm being told that we have six minutes remaining for the whole session. <laughs> so what I'm going to ask you to do is the panelists to respond to those questions, to do them justice, and give us your closing soundbite. What is a the take-home message for those who are going to send a social media message or want to tell their friends, you know, what a great afternoon. I came to the Agricultural Advantage closing session and, wow, the closing panel had these uh, key messages for us. So just reflect on that for a moment. Respond to those questions, key message. In, and we've got to do all of that in five and a half minutes and sum up. So very, very short, short intervention. Let's start uh, at this stage with Jonathan, please. Well, I think I would try to yeah, answer the question with more of uh, some keywords. So one will be, as I said, in terms of the sustainable food systems, I think there are some approaches that have been applied already and we find evidence in the field. I recently came back from Zambia where farmers are already practicing conservation agriculture, for example. In this case, minimize tillage and also crop rotation. So one thing we see here is that the strategies or the practices are already being applied and I think in terms of co-creation of knowledge basically we need uh, farmer-led approaches, uh, farmer-led innovations and also be able to upscale and outscale some of these strategies. I think we need to generally make um, yeah, agriculture itself very sexy for the youth so that they themselves can also get involved. Apart from that one last remark would be I think we need to break the silos, move away from the current pilot-based approaches and move more to transmissional research and also program implementation. Okay, well I'll start by um, alluding to Bruce's presentation this afternoon and saying uh, for agri agricultural transformation we need gender transformation um, and to really adapt and, and deal with climate change we really need to recognize that women are active agents, they have capacities, they have knowledge, they have experience, they have perspectives and concerns that may be the same as other members of their community, may be different, and that we need to ensure that all voices are heard and all capacities are supported. Uh, th thank you. On the issue of, of, of how policy design should change at the, at the national level, uh, um, my thinking is, is that it all needs to be very harmonized across the different modalities available to address climate change. Uh, we talk about NDCs, that's a national ambition to address climate change, but, but it's supported by 
the, the plans of action themselves, whether it's for mitigation or adaptation through the NAPs and for, for mitigation through NAMAs and so forth. I think the country has to, to manage the, the integrated nature of all of these uh, and ensure that the policies enable the, some of these actions to actually take place and effectively as well as and then assess some of the policies, whether it's incentives or whatever, to make sure that they are actually contributing to national development. And if things don't work, to, to be able to, to, to be brave enough to phase them out and replace them with something more effective. So, so I, I guess the key message then would be, would be, would be that, uh, that perhaps a holistic and integrative uh, approach to how we do work would be the, the key message from our interventions. Just maybe participation from the government support it is key. But uh, it's not only in the hands of the government. As uh, Paul just mentioned, I think it got to be an integrated approach forward, the public sector, the private sector, researchers, practitioners, all together. So when it comes about premium subsidy, we need to, to think about smart subsidization and invest in the gaps that are needed. Data is one of them. So sustainable approaches. So I couldn't agree more with Paul. What we need here, there are really integrated approaches where each and every contribution comes together with the same uh, mission and mission. So thank you very much. Yeah, great, thanks very much. So um, in closing, uh, Paul reminded us that if we do go to a four degree world, we're going to end up with a, a four letter outcome. Um, Olga reminded us insurance pro products really are about risk identification and risk management. Um, Jonathan gave us the, the concept of, of blended sustainability, and although it's, it, it's complex, we've got to start with farmers. And Sophia challenged us that to have an agricultural transformation, we really need to have a gender transformation in actions, views, and biases. So one thought in closing. We had the INDCs at Paris, the INDCs. We now have NDCs. We've lost the I. But actually, we need to bring it back because it should be the individually determined contributions. Each of you in the room is responsible for about 10 tons of CO2. What are you going to do? Easy to point the fingers at policymakers, the UN, foundations, researchers, institutes. What are you going to do to make sure that climate actions make a difference? And then we will have our IDCs and we will have progress. So please show a warm round of appreciation to our wonderful panel, Paul DeSanka, Olga Specker, Jonathan Mokshel, and Sophia Heyer. Please join me in giving them a warm round of congratulations.